So by now, I think everyone knows that the panel upgrade in 2 Sierra Papa is going to be in two stages. Uh, that's because Garmin's behind on delivering the G3X and also the new transponder. For those of you already checked out on the Skyline, this installation will be so similar that the transition should be seamless. But since it's going to be a phased installation, it's probably still worth watching this presentation. Nobody can argue that the success of the new avionics in 5.8 Hotel has been anything short of huge. And now we're taking this 25-year-old airplane and giving it a new life. This presentation is geared towards the member who is not checked out on the Skyline, but it still may be helpful for those who are already familiar. This just covers the first phase, which I'll get into in a minute. So in the first installation, hopefully within just a few days, we're going to have everything done except the G3X touchscreen and the GTX 345 transponder. Then, hopefully mid-May, the airplane will be down for a short period while we have the touchscreen and the transponder installed. In a nutshell, when this is all complete, hopefully by the end of May, there'll be only two differences from the Skyline. First, we have a GTN 650, not a 650XI. I'll talk about that shortly. And we also do not have the same number two NAVCOM. Instead, we're keeping the existing GNS 430W to fill that role. And it'll crosstalk with the GTN 650. You could argue that it's a more robust system since we'll have dual GPS WAS navigators. We'll also have updated checklists to make the two Cessnas as close to each other as possible and to include the new checks and emergency procedures for the 172. This presentation should give you a solid understanding of the functions and operation of the Phase 1 equipment. It's not going to make you an expert, that's up to you. Like any new equipment, it's also going to require some self-study and some time just poking around and playing with it. All the manuals you'll need are already on the website. Like everything, there are tons of videos available online too. The club has purchased the GPU now, so you don't have to burn tack time familiarizing yourself with this. But of course, you can't get the full picture without flying it. This is a quick recap of the training plan. Uh, again, if you're already qualified on both Cessnas, nothing to do. If you're one of the 17 members who does not fall into that category, then we think this is a prudent introduction. So for this first phase uh, that we're talking about right now, you'll watch this presentation, and it's available online too. Then we recommend that you get the 650 simulator on your iPad and play with that. It would also be wise to look at some of the Garmin videos on the autopilot and the G5 and be familiar with the manuals. And finally, a short flight with a CFI. The second phase is really all about the addition of the G3X. Uh, there'll be a separate short presentation on that. And then we also want, to play, want you to play with it on the ground with the GPU plugged in. And of course, a flight to put your new skills to work. And finally, if you're going to fly IFR and are new to these avionics, it would be prudent to get together with a CFI. So the 30,000 foot picture, this is our existing panel, and this is what we're keeping, the 430 Navigator. Everything else goes. But it's all for sale if you're interested. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll be stuck with most of the flight instruments until mid-May when we get the G3X. Here's a layout of our existing instrument panel. Should look familiar. Engine instruments and clock on the left, six pack tack on the bottom, dual CDI heads, and the beloved ADF. Now, just like the Skyline, we will ultimately have a backup PFD, a required instrument for IFR flight. That's the G5, and any of you who have flown the Skyline are familiar. The shop has decided that they can do some of the wiring ahead which will expedite the May installation. So they're gonna go ahead and install the G5 temporarily in the same slot as our attitude indicator. This leaves us with only one vacuum instrument, the DG. And we actually have heading, heading information on the G5, which we'll talk about in a minute. Then when the installation is completed, the G5 will be moved to its permanent home near where the number one CDI is. The added benefit here is that you'll become familiar with the G5 as a PFD before the main G3X installation. So the new G5 will be the only change to our flight instruments to begin with. But since that contains a fair bit more information than our old attitude indicator, let's take a closer look at it. With the attitude indicator gyro gone, this information may help in understanding the new instrument. 
Starting in the middle at the top, we have a magnetometer. It measures the magnetic field and using its own internal database, applies the variation to derive magnetic courses and headings. We still have our same old pitot-static system, but its information is now digitized. So what's always been purely mechanical in the past is now being crunched digitally by the air data computer. Inside that little Magic G5 box is an air data computer, the ADC, and an attitude heading reference system, the AHARS, an ingenious device with very precise inertial sensors. So what we've always seen with our beloved mechanical gyros is now all solid state digital. No more caging the gyro, no more resetting the DG, no more tapping the glass to free a sticking needle. All of this equipment is integrated with the G5 itself. And on top of that, the G5 has a 45 minute, um, uh, sorry, a four hour uh, backup battery in the case of a total electrical failure. The quick and dirty on the new primary flight display, the little, this little thing actually has everything that you have on the six pack flight instruments in a very compressed display. Of course, the G3X display will have all this stuff too in a larger format. And for that reason, in preparation for the G3X arrival, it would make good sense to familiarize yourself. So I'm gonna start in the lower right corner at about the five o'clock position. This knob has a number of functions, uh, but for now, this is where you set the Colesman window for the altimeter. Here's your VSI in a vertical tape format. The altimeter displays in a tape format too with a rolling barrel to highlight the greater detail. The heading indicator is a horizontal tape across the top. And now a little bit out of the flow, um, here's your glide path or glide slope indicator, technically known as the VDI, vertical deviation indicator. The uh, airspeed indicator, a vertical tape with a rolling barrel. Uh, ground speed indication, your CDI is here. Uh, and the turn coordinator, co bleh, turn coordinator shows the traditional ball and the turn rate is this uh, magenta bar with a tick for standard rate turn. So that's the quick tour. There's actually a lot more capability in here, but that gets you started. Now let's talk about what's changing on our avionics. Here's our existing radio stack. Uh, this should look familiar, and here's what's changing. Say bye-bye to the audio panel, and the same for the number two NAVCOM. Our beloved ADF deserves a special place in hell, and we're keeping the 430, and we're just uh, keeping the transponder, so these other stuff are moving down to make room for the rest of the installation. So the new rack will look like this. On the top of the stack is our new autopilot in the same exact same position as the Skylane. Next comes the new audio panel and the GTN 650. This 650 is just an earlier version of the one in the Skylane, but every bit is capable. There's really only one significant feature that this does not have, Smart Glide. Otherwise, it's almost identical. My personal experience playing with Smart Glide is that you really need to be up above 6,000 before you actually have any airports within glide range. Now, before I talk about these enhancements, uh, just a quick peek into the future. Well, not the distant future, but this summer anyways. This is what the finished product would look like with the G3X installed and the G5 in its new home and the new transponder at the bottom. Again, if you fly the Skylane, you'll see the similarities. Uh, we're able to re relocate the G5 on this panel, which is far better location, and we'll have a new uh, dual output power port over there on the far left side. So let's go back and talk uh, just a little bit about the first phase equipment that we're getting soon because we'll have another training bit for the May arrivals later. Starting at the top, the GFC 500 autopilot. Uh, not all of our members are familiar with autopilots that include flight directors. It's a sophisticated system with advanced functions, but it's simple to use and understand. Whether or not you use it, it's important to understand how it works. The autopilot and flight director are two different features controlled from the same panel, the AFCS panel. The flight director is the brains and the show, and the autopilot is the muscle and the movement. The flight director drives the V-bars or command bars, which give you visual guidance where to fly. You control it with the AFCS panel. Um, and by engaging the autopilot, you're telling the servo motors to take over and move the control services and make them follow the flight director. 
Press the autopilot uh, button in the middle to engage it. Now let's take a look at the AFCS mode control panel. This is where you tell the flight director that you want what you want the plane to do and where you engage the autopilot to do it. So looking at each actual button here, that YD button in the center means yaw damper, and we don't have one because we don't need one. Every other button up here is a momentary action on-off switch. Uh, push to turn on, push to turn off, except these two. The flight director button turns on the flight director, and if you were to push it again, you could turn it off, but if you had already engaged the autopilot, then you couldn't turn off just the flight director. Remember, the autopilot's the muscle. It must have the brains of the flight director to function. And the LVL button in blue, that's level. It's designed for use if you're disoriented or if you're overly busy. You're hand flying. You drop your sunglasses or pen or something. You hit the level button. It can be used anytime, regardless of whether the autopilot, flight director, or nothing is engaged. This button instantly engages the autopilot and flight director and commands zero roll and zero pitch. To get out of level mode is easy. Just engage another mode or disconnect the autopilot. And just like you'd expect, there's an autopilot disconnect button on the yoke. Push it once, the autopilot disengages and an oral alert sounds. Push it again and the oral alert stops. Now looking at the left third of the panel, you see that it contains lateral modes and the right third of the panel contains vertical modes. A knob on each side for selecting a new altitude or heading. And by the way, pushing either one of these buttons will sync your present altitude or heading. And additionally, on the right side, you'll see a wheel to roll up or down your vertical speed command um, or your airspeed command. So for example, if you were descending at 500 feet per minute and you wanted to hurry down at 800 feet per minute, you'd put your thumb on the wheel and push up, rolling it forward three clicks. Think of it like the elevator trim. Roll it forward, nose down. Roll it backward, nose up. And the same logic applies in indicated airspeed mode. Roll it forward for faster or a higher selected airspeed and backward for slower. Uh, finally, I just wanted to point out that this one button approach in the lateral section is kind of a hybrid selection because it can be both a lateral mode and a vertical mode. This autopilot is fully approach capable and while tracking a lateral course, it can capture a glide slope or glide path and follow it down to minimums. There is an autopilot limitation here. It must be off by 200 feet AGL. Now let's take a look at the flight director command bars, your visual cues. The, uh, the yellow features there are, are the airplane itself, the uh, wings on the left and the nose in the middle. And the uh, magenta figure is the V-bars for the flight director. Now I want to say again to keep in mind that the plane is still just a plane. It can be flown with or without the autopilot flight director and knowing when to turn the autopilot off is just as important as when to turn it on. It's just a button push away. So as we discussed the yellow symbol for the airplane is always there just like any attitude indicator. And when you turn on the flight director, the pink chevron appears. These are the V-bars. Garmin has a visual differentiation when you're using the flight director only or when you're using both the flight director and autopilot. So here you can see that the command bars appear hollow, meaning the flight director is on and the autopilot is off. The plane's being hand flown. Once the autopilot has been selected on, they appear solid. And when it's being used, the flight director, as the name implies, directs the flight. The direction is displayed through the command bars. If you tuck the airplane inside that pink chevron and keep it there, it, it'll direct you where to fly, both laterally and vertically, based on what you selected with the panel buttons. The convenience here is that it eases your instrument scan and relieves you of the requirement to refer to the other lateral and vertical cues. Just follow the bars. It gets its information from the selections that you make on the panel. So for example, in level flight, if you selected vertical speed mode up 500 feet per minute, the command bars would rise up above your airplane symbol and you would raise the nose to tuck it inside the command bars. 
And for a moment, let's assume you were in heading mode and you then moved your heading bug to the right of the nose, the flight director would command a roll right. Now let's take a look at the status box which displays your autopilot and flight director modes. If you're going to use the autopilot or flight director at all, this status box, nicknamed the scoreboard, is critical to understand and to include in your scan. Whenever you make a change with the mode control panel, you absolutely must verify that you got what you asked for by checking the scoreboard. There's a logic to the uh, enunciation where green is active or engaged and white means armed. Now, when phase two of the installation happens, you'll be looking at a nearly identical scoreboard, but on the G3X. It's a little easier to read simply because it's a little bit bigger. And on this final slide of the autopilot, it just shows you that the scoreboard layout, like the AFCS panel itself, also has a logic. The box in the middle enunciates the engagement status of the autopilot or flight director, and on either side of that, you have your lateral modes and vertical modes enunciated. And you can see by these lists on either side of this slide that there are quite a number of both lateral and vertical modes. So that's the very quick and dirty on the basics of our autopilot. Obviously, there's more to it, and the manual is actually part of the G5 manual. The chapter is labeled AFCS, and again, it's on the website. I'd like to take a quick look at the other two new items in the radio rack. First, the audio panel. It's a standard audio panel, easy to use for the basics. Uh, like any audio panel, you can select what you want to hear on top and select where you want to transmit on the bottom row. But there's a fair bit more than meets the eye, just uh, greater functionality if you want to take advantage of it. Uh, for example, you can connect your phone and make phone calls through your headset. The right seat pilot can participate too. Uh, it's handy for uh, picking up your IFR clearance from New York Tracon. You can also play back up to two and a half minutes of audio in blocks. You can do, do things like transmit simultaneously on two different frequencies, both the left seat pilot on one, the right seat pilot on the other. It's got a magnificent auto squelch. I've never had to play with the squelch on this guy lane. Uh, anyway, more stuff here to play with and learn. Again, the manual is on the website. Uh, here you can see the GTN 650. It looks virtually identical to the Skylane model except for these little items. There's no page menu like there is on the 650XI. You scroll down instead of right, and we see transponder field instead of estimated time en route to destination. And as I mentioned, this has no smart glide function. The other thing which you may or may not notice, uh, I'm told that the screen resolution and processor are, are not as good as the XI version on the Skyline. Uh, and one thing you'll notice is that this basically follows the same old Garmin menu structure that you're used to. The similarities will be very clear once you start playing with it. Here's the default nav page, which looks virtually identical to the Skylane. In fact, it looks virtually identical to the 430 default nav page, too. Uh, these are touchscreen buttons, touch to switch between uh, GPS and VLOC, and touch to turn the OBS mode on or off. We will not have the separate external button switches that 58 Hotel has. Those are installed by the previous owner and we kept them. And here's the map page, again, basically identical to both the Skyhawks 430 and the Skylanes 650XI. The menu button is equivalent to the menu button on the 430 530, and the menu options will look familiar too. So that's about it. Um, uh, I mentioned before that all the manuals are online. Go to the Skyhawk page and scroll down and then click on the button that says click for aircraft docks. Uh, the 650 iPad simulator is a great tool to familiarize yourself with. It's free download. Just make sure you get the correct version 650 as opposed to XI. Um, I'm not sure that the GPU will be needed for this phase one avionics, but it's there in the shed if you want it with an extension cord. Uh, move the plane down to the big hangar, and there's an outlet in there that we can use. Uh, obviously, you should still block the airplane on Schedule Master, and the master switch remains off. Uh, and as always, we ask you uh, on all of our equipment to please not change any data fields. It just makes it confusing for the next pilot. If there are data fields that you think legitimately should be changed for everyone, let us know, and we'll evaluate the request. 
so that about does it. Uh, questions, comments, and uh, just chat. Let's chat.